right from my own backyard, the Apollo landing sites, right there in my binoculars. Hello, everybody. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad you're with us to stay curious at the American Space Museum. And every Monday, we not only stay curious, we stay star curious with backyard astronomy tips from me, Stargazer Mark. We're in our studio today because it's a little cloudy outside, but behind me is a map of the moon because we're going to go over the Apollo landing sites that you can see with your binoculars from your own backyard, just like this. You're not going to see the flags on the moon. No telescope on Earth is even powerful enough to do that. Uh, but from lunar orbiters, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter that's been one of NASA's amazing robots in our solar system has close-up views of all six lunar landing sites that my good friend and co-producer Marty Winkle, he had a, something to do with that as a Grumman electrical engineer working on that ascent and descent stages of the lunar module. And it's the descent stages that are left there. And uh, Marty, how you doing? Good. I'm, I'm going to take my hat off here. I'll get too hot there, but uh, another week of stay curious and keeping people moon curious today. And here are the six sites, and this is the way the moon will look uh, tonight, except you're not going to see this half of it over here. Tuesday, February 8th, it is first quarter moon, and I'm going to show you a couple pictures of that. And right up beneath our American up there, the star for 15, Apollo 15, I'm going to particularly show you some details of how the astronauts looked at maps and were trained in that area of the moon. Uh, so hope, hope that you enjoy getting a little moonshine on this kickoff week of uh, Stay Curious. After all, moonshines can't get too much of that. But uh, we wanted to, right behind me here is a picture, Marty. We may have to move that because we forgot to move. There we go. This is... Right out of the chute, I'm going to show you what the Apollo 12 astronauts were looking at when to land on the moon, the ellipse where they were going to land. And somewhere in there is a crater that Surveyor 3, the Surveyor 3 spacecraft was there for their pinpoint landing that they went up to and took parts of it off of. But these were the type of maps that the astronauts studied. And then, of course, they had the simulations at the flight crew training building where the, the, the greatest... Uh, uh, game show uh, uh, machine of the era. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, Marty. I'm thinking what kind of games people play? Video game, v greatest video game of all, the Lunar Lander, uh, where they would practice on actually going down to the surface on uh, relief maps that were a replica of the texture. So, hope you. We're going to talk about the moon and how they chose some of the moon's landing sites, but. I wanted to tell you that we're going to kick our week off with tomorrow. We're going to have Hugh Harris here right beside me here in our uh, American Space Museum Stay Curious Studios. Hugh Harris, the voice of NASA, public uh, information officer for over 35 years for NASA. Once a month, he's going to come and talk to us about the shuttles of the month there. So look forward to seeing you tomorrow, Hugh. And also on Thursday, we're going to have this pretty lady, Sharon McDougall, is going to be here. She is a retired spacesuit tech at Johnson Space Center. We're going to do a Google Meets with her, and I've talked to her this morning. This is a book she wrote, Suit Up for Launch with Shay. And this is quite an engaging woman that is very well connected at the Johnson Space Center still uh, and she, her job was to put the astronauts in their orange pumpkin suits and in other EVA suits. And we're going to hear all about that from Sharon McDougall on Thursday to help you stay curious. Well, let's get to the map here behind me, Marty. And there's a, the, the same map that's behind me here showing you the uh, places that we landed on the moon, the six landing sites. Before we could go there with humans, we went there with unmanned spacecraft. First, the Ranger spacecraft that crashed into the moon, kamikaze style as it took film all the way to the end. And then the Surveyor, spindly legged, three legged robots that landed there. Because we did not know if the moon's surface 
if you landed on it, would you drop into 20 feet of uh, uh, dust? Would it be so brittle that uh, a 10 ton spacecraft would crash through, uh, through, through it? All kinds of conjectures in different areas of the moon are definitely different, like different areas of the earth. Well, let me talk a little about how we chose these moon sites. Let me get a little rocket fuel here on my uh, caution may randomly start talking about astronomy cup. Ah, that was a, a nice gift from um, Marty one year. Appreciate that, Marty. So the first landing sites were actually chosen on February 8th, 1968, after two years of study. NASA's Apollo Site Selection Board announced five potential landing sites where they thought would be the smoothest and easiest places on the moon to land. Now, part of that criteria was they had to be along the equator. Okay, and uh, I'm going to show you this one first here. There are the five landing sites, one, two, three, four, and five. They wanted to be along the equator because that save the most fuel on the lunar module's descent when you go or, uh, orbital mechanics when you're orbiting around an object they wanted to orbit of course around the equator and when they went up or below or be uh, above north or south that would expend more fuel though we did do that on 15 and 16 and 17 but the first couple were going to be planned right along and where it ended up where you see the two that is where Tranquility Base was chosen on the two. The four and five actually ended up being these landing sites. Four was Apollo 12 and five was, uh, well, not quite five, about where three is. Uh, that was Apollo 14's landing site or Apollo 13's intended landing site. They also wanted to choose sites that were of geologic interest because the Apollo program wanted to find out about the moon where did it come from? Its origins. How, did, how was it created? There's three theories of thought. One, it was created uh, separate from the Earth and coalesced in the primordial soup of our solar system as an independent body. Or it was uh, uh, near, nearby us. Or it developed and became a moon in the solar system and flew by earth and was captured by the earth gravitational capture or it was ripped out of the earth by an impact of an object about the size of mars that ripped out of the outer layers of the moon out that is what the apollo story tells us that the moon was once part of earth ripped out during the early early days when when things were still molten lava basically clumping together and it coalesced as the lighter materials because it is light uh, in m minerals, not much iron on it. Uh, and uh, it, it mimics the outer mantle of the Earth's crust. But that's still not the definitive answer. There are some anomalies to that, that it was created out of the Earth, which the, the Pacific Ocean fits about the perfect scenario where it was ejected out of or ripped out of. So we still need to go back to the moon to find out more about where it came from in its evolution. We do know the Earth and the moon and the solar system is about four and a half billion with a B years old. And the oldest rocks brought back from the moon are four billion years old. The rocks brought back from Apollo 11 there were about three and a half billion years old, kind of young, young uh, uh, moon rocks. Well, as we go back uh, to look at this map, we see the yellow areas are where the surveyor spacecraft landed. The red, the, the green, you see the green triangles, those are where the six landing sites are. And the red are where Russia landed. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight robots they've landed on the moon. Three of them brought back soil from the moon, okay? So they had an ambitious, uh, until about 1990s, an ambitious moon program where they were uh, trying to rove on the moon. They've, they've had several vehicles drive over 20 miles on the moon, which we've not put a rover on the moon unmanned. We've never put a vehicle on the moon that is moving around, okay? Yet on the back side of the moon, China has a rover. On the back side of the moon, they had to put a satellite 
uh, in an orbit around the moon so they could get those signals from the backside. So not just the uh, uh, Americans, but Russia and China have landed successfully objects on the moon. Well, the first investigation of what the moon was like started with the uh, a program called Ranger, okay? In Ranger, here you see in the uh, uh, over at Kennedy Space Center before they folded up the, they're folding up the solar panels. It wasn't very big. It was equipped with about eight different cameras that in a kamikaze style as it was launched on an Atlas D rocket here from Kennedy Space Center, just 10 miles away from where I sit. Uh, it was actually launched from the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. These 1966 reconnaissance uh, spacecraft would, on the upper left, is a crater 50 miles wide. All the way down to the lower right is showing you craters less than six feet across. And the little circles that you see in those photos is where the impact was of the, the Ranger spacecraft, this one being Ranger 9 that went into the crater Alphonsus. Uh, it may have been Ranger 8, but I, uh, that is the crater Alphonsus there. So it was beaming back a video broadcast continuously as it got closer and closer and closer. Those videos were, were chopped up into images. And then we got an idea that even down to the feet level, craters, craters everywhere. Even though you're about, oh, maybe a mile above the surface on the lower right-hand photo versus uh, 200 miles above in the upper left-hand photo, the terrain looks the same. Craters, craters everywhere. Why? Because the moon doesn't have an atmosphere. All of this cosmic debris circling in our solar system, and there's a lot of it there. Uh, it's not... Our solar system is not void of, of, of matter. It's like uh, mosquitoes and gnats, small particles uh, the size of, of salt grains enter our Earth's atmosphere as meteors. But on the moon, they hit and create a small crater. So they came up with this zone of interest, all right, from the Ranger photos. And they said, well, where are we going to land the surveyor spacecraft, okay? We're looking for the smoothest spot where that six is, is where uh, is sort of where a ranger uh, had impacted. And there was, a, there was nine rangers, and they had problems with the first six, and seven, eight, and nine were successful. Very complicated. The first ranger spacecraft even missed the moon. Such was space technology back in the early 60s that, okay, we missed by a thousand miles. Now we know what the trajectory needs to be, and we'll... We'll hit it this time. So of consideration was uh, approach paths. There could be no large hills, tall cliffs, deep craters, propellant. The least amount of fuel had to be expended. Uh, free return. The sites must be within, within reach of the Apollo spacecraft for a free return. If uh, uh, the, uh, the engines didn't fire, lighting had to be visible, optimum lighting. And that's important. All of the Apollo launches were launched right when the, the, the landing site was right on the Terminator because it was going to take three days. Sometimes it wasn't even visible from Earth because in the three days, the Terminator or day and nighttime line of the moon changes by the hour. And so in three days, it would move over to where you would see the landing site. And they wanted long shadows like early morning or early evening so that the long shadows would show us a lot more detail. That's why we enjoy the morning and evening twilight so much, because of the shadows and the textures we see. Whereas at noontime, with the sun overhead, there's no shadows, and things are kind of boring and dull. Well, here's the Surveyor spacecraft, as photographed by Apollo 12. After we landed Apollo 11 in the Sea of Tranquility, it actually missed its mark by almost four miles due to mass concentrations underneath the lunar surface that were big areas of lumpy uh, iron and rock, though there's not much iron on the moon, but where it is, it, it gathered together to create gravity that would like two magnets over each other, a, a positive force. It leaps over it quickly, 
or it drags across it if it's if it's uh, the opposite force. And that's what caused uh, Apollo 11 to be almost four miles off their landing that they trained on and why it was so miraculous and so skillful for Neil Armstrong to bring that eagle down with Buzz Aldrin uh, helping him uh, in an unknown territory, basically. But here, the Apollo 12, they wanted to land pinpoint landing. They fixed the, 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 the guidance system to where it could detect the mass concentrations of gravity called mass cons. And they landed within 600 feet of this lunar uh, robot that had landed almost two years earlier. Here you see the parts. And I'm using the one on the moon instead of one on the Earth to show you the complicated parts of this little uh, vehicle. Once again, you didn't need any streamlined uh, contoured uh, uh, body on it because there's no uh, atmosphere on the moon. You see on the far right, the accordion was the service sampler arm that actually dug into the surface. That was so important to see the tensile strength of this, this regolith is what they call the lunar surface. The regolith is like, and it's a lot like a sand on the beach. It's not very much different, except it's a lot finer than sand, but it has a, a texture that doesn't clump together like dirt would up in Ohio or Michigan or, or traditional dark, dark uh, dirt somewhere, nor was it like a clay that, that uh, would uh, uh, be smooth as you dug it up. And there's two different textures on Earth that we wondered how different was the moon wherever, wherever we went. The TV camera, by the way, and the sampler arm are now in museums. TV camera, I think, is in the Smithsonian in Washington. I know the arm, I've seen it, is at the Cosmosphere in Hutchinson, Kansas. But uh, So all of these type of devices were applied to the lunar module, like the, uh, uh, the altimeter and velocity sensing antenna and so forth. And here is on the left, on the right side, is the uh, the actual transmission of a uh, so this, the uh, surveyor digging into the ground, and then they would put this uh, on a in a in a device to kind of test it, what it was made of, and then over on the left is the Apollo 12 astronauts when they walked up to it, they saw the very same uh, holes dug a year and a half earlier, no change because. There's no erosion on the moon. Erosion on the moon by micrometeorite dust takes millions of years to beat things down. But it has fluffed up the lunar regolith or soil to where it's like sandy. Here is the lunar module descent stage of Apollo 11. You see at the bottom, 50 meters, is uh, 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 the crater... The big, largest crater there is only 50 meters across. They're right of center. So that's uh, 150 feet approximately across. Uh, the lunar module is br brightly lit there, the descent stage. You can see the footprints of the astronauts in the uh, uh, PSP is the uh, uh, science experiment that, that uh, was put out by Aldrin while Neil Armstrong went over to the edge of that crater that you see by his footprints, taken by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter that dipped down to about 20 miles, sometimes even 10 miles, to take these beautiful pictures, proof that we were on the moon. And, of course, we've got conspiracy people that say it was a hoax. And you know what? If it was a hoax, then I'm going to ask Marty to repay all the money that he was paid by the Grumman uh, uh, corporation to work on that lunar module because there's 400,000 people that got paid a total of something like $30 billion in, in salaries to build the, and go to the moon. So that would be the reparations of all. But uh, astronauts, when questioned about going to the moon, they say, hmm, well, if we didn't go, how come the Russians aren't saying we didn't go? Because they wanted to show communism was supreme by beating us to the moon. But an amazing photo, and what you're looking at there, Marty, from uh, the crater over on the right, and I forget what they named that crater, um, but that's supposedly the crater that Neil Armstrong went over and threw something from his deceased daughter in that crater. 
at least I believe he did because several people have told me he did, uh, in, uh, including the late Jay Barbary, who wrote a book on Neil Armstrong that's in our library here. Marty, we're looking at a basketball court. That's about what you're looking at between the big crater center right and, and the, 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 the one that's just left of the, the limb there. That, so they didn't walk around a, a, a great distance on that first lunar landing, nor did they want to. But they were so surprised, even right down to the foot, there are craters and boulders that are treacherous all over the moon. And here again is Apollo 12, looking at what that would have looked like uh, to them. Uh, and Apollo 11 had the same kind of maps that they used to, to try to figure out where they were. There's Apollo 12, uh, astronaut, uh, I believe that's probably uh, Alan Bean, with Pete Conrad taking the picture. And you can see how close they were as the edge of the crater is their, uh, their lunar module number 7, uh, I mean LM6. Uh, which they called Marty. What they call that lamb? I'm, I'm escaping me too. Let me get some more rocket fuel there. And here are all six lunar landing sites. Apollo 11. There, like I showed you, 12. You see at the lower right is Surveyor Crater with where the Surveyor was. Uh, their first EV, and then Apollo 14, 15. We're going to show you in depth. And 16 is where Orion is. Uh, and uh, uh, Yankee Clipper was the, was the command module on, on 12. And uh, oh, you're looking it up for me. Good, Marty. It'll drive us nuts. Challenger over there. And they even show you where the flag is and the lunar rover final resting spot you see. Look these up for yourself. All you got to do is Google Apollo landing sites from LRO. Intrepid. Intrepid, yes, of course, a Navy Intrepid. Thank you, Marty, because it was an all-Navy crew and the Intrepid uh, Destroyer, I think they named it after. Uh, so here is the first quarter moon, how it's going to look tomorrow. And where we're going to look is Apollo 15 is up there at the, uh, at the top, and it's in the, in the, in the uh, craters. It's in the Terminator right now. And as you see, Terminator, the line between night and day, uh, go up the top, uh, up at the top further. Yep. And just to the, the, the left more. Yep. Right in there is where we're going, where those mountain ranges are. Just breaking the, the, the light and go down a little further and follow the curve of that Apennine mountain range. And Apollo 15's in there. Keep going down further, Marty. And a little further, a little further is... Uh, Keep going down straight down, right about right there. Right about there is where Apollo 11 landed. So when you're looking at the moon tonight, you want to see the oval on the right-hand side, Mercrisium, as you see on, on our green screen there, is the oval, uh, Sea of Crisis. And then the next sea over, when you go to the shore of that sea, where the mountains are, that's where Apollo 11 was. And we'll see another picture. Here is a close-up, like through a telescope, where you see the Apollo 15 landing site, marked there in the Apennine Mountains. Up at the very top, you see a, a valley cutting through the mountains. That's the Alpine Valley. And we will be seeing this on Thursday. The moon will look like this, and you'll see the Apollo 15 landing site. That is one of the most interesting. They chose interesting sites uh, uh, the first two, they just wanted to make sure they got down and pinpoint landing. Then Apollo 13, which of course became 14, was interested in trying to land in an area where that Mare Imbrium, up above me up there, Mare Imbrium, when it was formed by an asteroid hitting the moon, the debris tossed out by it is where the 14 is. And they wanted to go there to see the insides of the moon because that Mare Imbrium excavated maybe 50 miles or, or, long, or more into the moon and scooped it out and threw it across the, the, uh, the moon. Also, that crater Copernicus, crater Copernicus there above the 12 and the 13, you see the rays coming out of it, Marty, the light material. 
in in uh, the uh, era. Well, that is ejecta that was thrown out by the impact that created that, that crater maybe 50 million years ago, but it's fresh compared to billions of years. So we actually landed uh, 12 and 14, they hopefully was going to catch some of the material from that Coper Copernicus rays. So one of the people I wanted to mention that trained the astronauts how to geologically understand what they were looking at on the moon was this man Lee Silver I did not pull up the picture why don't you zoom in there you go I think you can tell Lee Silver there Lee Silver died January 31st 96 years old old school stay curious here the way Marty and I used to do it all right a great guy uh, he was born in Monticello New York uh, but he grew up in in, uh, in the West, studied geological formations in Arizona and the San Gabriel Mountains while working for the U.S. Geological Survey. And he's most famous for his contributions to the Apollo program, instructing the astronauts on geology and lunar sample selection. And his Caltech alumnus, Harrison Jack Schmidt, uh, was uh, hand-chosen by him to be the astronaut geologist that went to the moon on Apollo 17. Schmidt was chosen as an astronaut beforehand, but he learned his training from this man. Lee Silver lived a great age in 96. He is one of the unsung heroes of the Apollo program. And particularly Neil Armstrong liked him. And, and Neil brought back, though they only brought back 96 pounds of material from the moon. Uh, Neil, when he went over to that one crater, he brought back a very special uh, collection of rocks that were dug up out of that crater and really, really helped tell the story of uh, the moon being part of the earth. There was also a Farouk Elbaz was another gentleman who was very involved in selecting the lunar, lunar sites. He worked for NASA. Uh, Farouk was, uh, um, uh, had, had, a, had a strong uh, choice. He, he was one of the guys, the geologists that chose the landing sites. Uh, specific locations, of course, safety was the number one. Orbital timing was another. Uh, they had to make it safe and sound. Uh, uh, Apollo 12, uh, after the Apollo 11 landing, uh, and the LEM landing so far away, they really wanted an accurate landing, and they got it with Apollo 12, landing in the ocean of storms, right over there behind me there, Marty. And... Uh, Apollo 13 and 14 went to Cone Crater, okay, and uh, Cone Crater's right where 14 is there by Copernicus. It was chosen because it was large enough to penetrate the regolith when it impacted and throw out some debris, but it found to be very uh, uh, hard to walk in that. That was the thickest regolith that we walked in of all the six missions. It was like walking in a snow up to your... Uh, it got way between above their ankles and between their shin, their, their ankles and their knees. It was very fatiguing. So they did not get to look inside of Cone Crater like they wanted to. They had to come back. Apollo 15 landed at Hadley Rill, and I'm going to show you that rocky area. Apollo 16 was chosen because of a suspected volcanic activity around a region called Descartes. That's where you see the mountain region there, 16. Uh, Mer, uh, just to the west of Mer Nectar Nectaris, the Sea of Nectar. Well, Apollo 16 kind of fooled the geologists because what they thought was um, volcanic activity wasn't, uh, uh, but, but that in itself was a scientific discovery that from orbit they couldn't, that they learned new lessons. Uh, however, there was fissure type, and we're not talking, there are fissure volcanoes, erupted and spewed orange soil like glass globules uh, up uh, in the air. And that was a big discovery with Apollo 16. They're even shouting out, orange soil, orange soil, uh, is what Schmidt was saying. And Commander Cernan says, don't touch it till I get there. I want to see it. And then Apollo 17, you see where it landed, uh, is uh, uh, was again an, an area chosen uh, specifically uh, for to find old and new material because this was a mix of area where you had these these giant mountains 
in a low plains with large blocks, a dark mantle, and dark halo craters that could have been volcanic uh, of origin in the site there. So, uh, and then we were planning on going see that Aristarchus below Stay Curious. That may have been where Fred Hayes would have commanded Apollo 18 to land. Marty, you said you had a question. Yeah, Apollo Sun. <clears throat> How deep is uh, Copernicus? How deep is Copernicus? That's a good question there, Apollo Sun. Thank you for watching. Uh, it's about uh, two miles deep, I believe, uh, with the central peak that rises up from the center over uh, a mile and a half high. Uh, but that's a great question uh, that, uh, Brian, uh, that, that, led, that leads it to, though it's one-fourth the size of the Earth at 2,000 miles across, all right, uh, uh, which is from the, you know, of course, from the, our, the, our United States. Uh, uh, it would fit inside the borders of the United States. Yet it has mountains higher than Mount Everest and lower areas lower than the Marianas Trench of six miles. So a lot of, act, a lot of violence has created this. Let's see what other picture I got lined up there. Okay, we're going to go... Uh, and we love everybody watching us today on Stay Curious. We got the UCAC brothers, Tom and Mark. Thank you for watching. Uh, and Larry Pusker. Hey, Larry. Uh, in Michigan, Christopher Mick. Thank you for watching in Wisconsin. Uh, Robert Law is watching from uh, his evening uh, uh, in uh, Dundee, Scotland. Samuel Garcia. Good to see you on there. Hazel Banks. Hi, Hazel. Hazel knew... Uh, Farouk Elbaz, the geologist, and showed me an autographed um, book of his uh, uh, moon uh, uh, treatise his, his, uh, about the Apollo landing sites there. And uh, Cliff Watson, thank you for 50 stars, Cliff. He's in Panoma, Australia, where uh, he's looking at the moon upside down. Yes, it would be upside down with the, uh, from uh, the Southern Hemisphere. And uh, uh, Jason uh, Cristofoli, thank you, Jason, for watching. And thank you for 50 stars, Cliff. You give us a star, that's a penny, and uh, to go into our coffers. Marty, can you move that line over there, that picture behind me there? No, I, I've got a picture up there. there there's another one there. We're there you go. This is Hadley Rill. This is one of the, the coolest landing sites chosen, uh, in my opinion, one of the most dangerous uh, that David Scott and Jim Irwin were in the lunar module that landed there. It came all the way over that mountain, and we're going to see. So they would study uh, these pictures. Are That's a pretty good high-power telescope, uh, like on Kitt Peak or something like that, took that picture. But then they created these drawings of how we were going to land. That is the site, and they were going to go up to this lunar rill, R-I-L-L-E. What this is is not a flowing river. It's actually a tube of lava that was meandering under the surface. And then when the lo hot lava uh, evaporated, went out of it, the tube collapsed on itself. And they wanted to look inside of that, see if there were striated layers, uh, not from water layering, but from layering of the billions of years of material on top of the, uh, the lunar surface. And then you see... Uh, they had three EVAs using the rover. The first one went over to the edge, looking into the crater, uh, uh, the canyons of the uh, the rill. And then the, the second EVA went down to Mount Hadley uh, at the base of that mountain. And then the third, they went over to check out those interesting craters and see what they could find. Here's what the astronauts would also look at, contours to, to uh uh, of depths and so forth accurately on EVA-1. This is going over to Hadley Rill, where you see the line, you see elbow, you, the, you see the stations that they're, they're staying at or the round circles. And then, of course, all those lines are the, the layering depths of that rill and then over uh, and in front of the mountaintop there. And here is a photo of that rill in the landing site taken by... Uh, maybe Apollo 14, maybe Apollo 12 took these po photos. Uh, the command module pilot, Dick Gordon, may have taken that. 
or on Apollo 14 that had been Stu Rosa orbiting by himself. And that was part of their job was to look for at the proposed landing sites and get as detailed as they can. And then they would overlay with the, the uh, kind of plan that they would put in place to do their geology. So we go back to the way the moon's going to look first quarter uh, 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 on uh, about Thursday. You'll see this part of the moon. But with binoculars, you can see these features on the moon. And all these features have names. And get you a moon map. Download a moon map. Uh, uh, or you might have a moon map in an encyclopedia. But it's fun to get to know the names of the moon. And here's the moon, how it's going to look on February 8th. First quarter moon. We see half of it. And uh, I don't know why we don't call it first half moon, because there's three others, the whole backside and a quarter of the front side we don't see. And once again, Mercrisium is that little oval in the upper right-hand side. I'm always looking for that in uh, movies and TV uh, where they show in the moon to make sure they've got it right. You'll be amazed. Sometimes they'll even show a moon of the, uh, uh, in a movie or something that shows the backside of the moon from one of the Apollo missions that you couldn't possibly see. So I so hope that you learned a little bit about how we determined landing on the moon and that it wasn't uh, uh, just a, a kind of, well, that kind of looks like an interesting feature. Let's go there. That was part of it. But part of the science was learning about the moon. And we mostly went to places where we could find insides of the moon churned up by meteor impacts laying there in, in, in the form of boulders and maybe debris that was tossed a hundred miles across the lunar surface and landed there. So where are we going back to the moon? Well, let me, as I just thought about that, Marty, let's go to this, go back to that picture. Where we're going back to the moon, the bottom part at the very bottom of this picture. Almost out of sight is a crater called Shackleford, and part of that crater never gets sunlight. And so that means there's ice in the bottom of that crater because we've had unmanned orbiters go over this and know that there is ice buried under the poles of the moon, particularly the South Pole, in craters that never get sunlight. So our Artemis moon program is going to the bottom part of the moon. All right, that's going to create... A, a different scenario where instead of orbiting like we said east and west across the moon they'll probably orbit north and south over the north and south pole which we've never done with humans so that that will allow as little fuel as possible to go down if they went on the equator they would have to uh, go down but that's still up for conjecture in fact from our Artemis uh, lunar station called the Gateway, and they take that SpaceX spaceship down. Marty, I think it just might be direct descent from the Gateway and not even orbit the moon. Uh, and we're not clear about that because NASA hasn't released the exact details about what they're doing. But right now, you better believe it, that Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and other spacecraft and telescopes on Earth are, are looking at these areas to see uh, what's the best way to approach to land there. So we can't wait for it. Boy, we need to go back to the moon big time, uh, uh, not just to learn all about its, its uh, science, but to expand man's horizons again, because the, without a doubt, 50 years ago, man was leaving the moon with Apollo 14 in February of 1972. 51 uh, years ago, we were... Uh, 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 on 52 years ago, I mean, on, on the moon, no, 51, on Apollo 14. And then April this year, we're going to celebrate Apollo 16 landing on the moon 50 years ago. In December, it'll be 50 years ago that the last landing on the moon was made. And uh, the moon is full of minerals uh, and isotopes that was self-sustaining for what humans need to build as well as uh, live on the moon. We can make oxygen, we can make fuel for rockets, and we know now, thanks to some of the science we've done 50 years with some of the moon rocks, that we can take that moon dust and make moon mud out of it and, and extrude buildings out of it in a 3D 
type of uh, 3D printer type of way. So can't wait for all that to happen. But I also can't wait for this week to get rolling again with Stay Curious. We have got Hugh Harris on Tuesday, uh, the voice of NASA. He's going to be with us once a month to talk about the shuttles of the month. So enjoy Hugh Harris tomorrow. And then Tuesday, Thursday, we're going to have Sharon McDougall, a really well-known spacesuit technician that's retired uh, after the shuttle era and is promoting uh, uh, STEAM education. She's got a cute little book about an astronaut going to space. And so we're going to talk to Sharon McDougall on Thursday via Zoom from Houston. And so we can't wait for all that. So thank you, Marty. Anything else going on with our friends and family out there and just stay curious world. Just some comments about some of the other uh, uh, surveyors and things like that. But just FYI type stuff. Yes, we had uh, of seven surveyors go to the moon, five successful. There were nine rangers. They didn't get that thing fine-tuned until the last three, uh, the three, I think Surveyor 7 was the first successful one. But such is rocket science. They learn from all their mistakes, just like we did on our Apollo lunar landings. The last three with the rovers were doing serious raw science, where the, the other three were more or less trying to uh, perfect the accuracy and safety of landing on the moon. Yeah, and Robert Lewis talking about, well, he mentioned the Soviets at Lunar... Lunacod? Yeah, Lunacod. Yeah, the, the Soviets, like I showed you in that picture, uh, had three rovers on the moon, and, and, and two of them went over 20 miles and lasted for, man, over, over a couple years. The lunar day is 28 and a half days, okay? So uh, uh, they would succumb to the lunar night, and actually they had a lid that closed on those lunar rovers. They looked like a bathtub on wheels. You all now know what that looks like, those lunacons. So we'll have another show on on more of that to stay curious. Yes, Marty. Yeah, Cliff Watson said, good that you were showing the landing places as I am often asked if they went and don't even mention flat. He doesn't even mention what? Flat, flat Earth. Oh, flat, flat Earth. Earth. Yeah, yeah, the two things, the, the lunar hoax, like I said, I want Marty to repay all the money he made because he's living on a good retirement like all NASA people are. And number two, um, uh, if the Earth is flat, I've never heard of the Flat Mars Society, okay, or the Flat Venus Society, so or the Flat Moon Society for that matter, so... But there's room for everybody on this world, Marty, and uh, those that uh, choose to uh, disagree, that's fine. We respect your opinion, but don't let the facts get in the way of your opinion. Ha, ha, ha. So, well, until tomorrow when we bring Hugh Harris with you, the voice of NASA, and on behalf of our wonderful museum and our, uh, our executive director's uh, leadership, Karen Conklin, I'm Mark Marquette, and we will see you tomorrow to bridge the space between us.